Yeah, before I start today, I just wanted to say I'm so pleased to see Andy with us. Um, I, would, I actually heard you when we first came in. I heard you cheer. And I said to Sam, I said, is Andy here? And she said, yes. And then I thought, so I'm so pleased to see you. And I was actually thinking of Andy this week because I remembered when I went to university and Andy prepared for me a pencil case and he filled it with colour and pens and highlighters and biros and everything that I could need for my studies. And that always stays with me because in some ways it was so simple but it really, it was much more profound than that. And I just really want to commend Andy for that and how, what he is to us as a family. And um, yeah, so just great to see you, Andy, and thank you for that. Um, today we're looking at 1 Kings 12. So we're just over halfway through 1 Kings. And we're, we've been, so far when we've been looking at kings, we've seen a united kingdom under one monarch. And what we're going to see today is the kingdom split. So the kingdom of Israel is going to split into Israel, into Judah, with two separate kings. Um, and it's a time of real turmoil for the people of Israel. And the main thing that I feel for today, I'm going to say lots of different things, but the main thing that I felt when I was preparing it is that God really wants to renew our hope in him, and that sometimes life can feel a bit like 1 Kings 12, and it can feel like God's plans have been thwarted and things are not going to plan and we can feel really confused and hurt and I think a lot of us are walking slightly wounded at the moment and I really feel that today God wants to remind us where our hope is that it's not in the circumstance but actually we know how the story ends we know that Jesus is resurrected and that our hope is in him Um, so that's the main thing that I want to say today but I will talk for a bit longer still (laughs) Um, Dan's going to read for me. This first bit is quite long, so I don't know if... Dan, maybe you just want to read that first one and then I'll summarise it and then these two after. One Kings 12, verse 1 to 5. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone there to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, He was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon. He returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Jeroboam and said to him, Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. Rehoboam answered, Go away for three days and then come back to me. So the people went away. So this is really set in the scene for 1 Kings 12, and it's where it starts to go wrong for Rehoboam. People come to him and ask for mercy. Um, He's just been crowned king. Solomon has now died, and he's now the king. They've come to him and said, please lessen the load that your father put on us. We can't take it anymore. And we're now going to hear his response. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. They replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elders and he consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. He asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, Lighten the yoke that your father put on us. The young men who had grown up with him replied, These people have said to you, Your father put a heavy yoke on us. Make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Three days later... Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam. As the king had said, come back to me in three days. The king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given him by the elders. He followed the advice of the young men and said, my father made your yoke heavy, I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips, I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn events was from the Lord, to fulfill the word that the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through Ad- Ah, Ahijah, Ahijah, the Shilonite. 
Great, thank you, Dan. Um, so we just read quite a long chunk there. What I would like you to do is turn to the person next to you and tell them what you understood has just happened in the story. You have two minutes. Right, okay then. I'm wondering if anyone feels confident enough to try and summarize what they think just happened. Anyone think that they can have a go at saying what they think's happened in the story? No one. Yeah? He was very weak. Yes, he's a, a weak king, definitely. The problem with Ray, he has to be a tough guy like a king. Definitely, he feels like he needs to be a tough guy. He feels like he needs all of these words and to talk about scourging with scorpions, scourging with whips. I think that's good. I think that, that's the main thing, really, that's happened here, is that he's been crowned king, but he's not really confident in his role, and he's gone around and shopped for advice, first of all from the elders and then from the young men. And then he's listened to the young men and been quite foolish, really, because this is what is going to lead to the splitting of the kingdom, because people are not going to follow him. And the thing that I found really key here is that he says, he doesn't, you know, like when you speak to John and we always say, John always says, what does God want? But he doesn't say that at all. He says, how would you advise me? He's not, he's not actually asking these people to help him understand what God wants. He's just looking for advice. And there's actually a difference between advice and what God says. Um, and dad's actually going to help me with an example um, if you want to come up, Dad. And this is a story that um, I grew up hearing from, like, it's about my parents. Um, but I think it's really key in terms of this contrast between getting advice and then going to someone to, for them to help you understand what God's saying. So, um, yeah, she grew up, what she means is she, it was something I kept talking about. But, uh, yeah. So I'm going to try and get this nice story nice and short. So um, some of you might not know, but... Um, Christina and I got married in 92, which was in the last millennium, just in case you're confused. Um, and uh, she got a job with a small company called Deloitte's, uh, Touche Ross, and after she graduated and she was working there. And um, she was training to be a chartered accountant, and the workload was nine to five, plus a commute, plus 15 hours of homework a week. And it was not a happy time. It was a really unhappy time for us. Um, we bought somewhere, and we needed both our salaries for, for, for the mortgage. That, at least that's what the mortgage man told us. So that's what we borrowed, and that's what we had to pay. I just started teaching. And, um, and so Christina was, but Christina was really kind of struggling. She'd done two years of training. It was a three-year training. She'd not failed anything, as far as I remember. Can you imagine Christina failing? Anything? <laughs> so... So she'd not failed anything, but she was hating it and very, very uh, unhappy. Now, we were part of the church, but we were living over in another area. And everyone around us was saying, look, you know, you've done two, two and a bit years. I think you should stick with it. I think you should stick with it. You should see it through. And I just, it was, I think perhaps they hadn't realized, partly, the pressure that Christina was under. But also, I think it was advice. It was every sensible thing was to stick with what she'd done. It was a really competitive job to get. She was really close to finishing, but she was qualifying for a job that she hated, really. That was, that was the bottom line. And I felt God say to me, I'm going to provide for your family through your job. Um, that's, that's what I'm going to do. I know that's not what the numbers say, but that's what I'm going to do. And so... But all the advice around us was the same. So we went to a couple that were in the church at the time, Alan and Jenny, who were one of some of the elders. 
of the church. And we went to them and we said, I, I said, look, this is the situation. This is what I'm sensing. Um, but it doesn't seem very wise. But that's what I think God's saying. And the very profound word that he gave me, if we pray together, Alan said, I think God's saying he doesn't mind. He doesn't mind. Now, I know that sounds like it wasn't God's word, but it actually was for me, because what it did was it released us to do something that was not sensible, but was actually what God wanted for our household. And ultimately, I believe that God showed me what we needed to do. And, you know, husbands, that's something I think God helps us with. You know, I think sometimes we can hear God. And for our partners, I think God helps us to hear God for one another. Bring those struggles to God. Expect him to speak to you. But don't just go out on your own. Speak to someone. It wasn't just one of my mates. I, we went as a couple to elders in the church and we said, look, this is a thing we're troubled by. So we weren't advice shopping. It wasn't that the people around us gave an advice that we didn't like. But I just felt there was something more to it. And that's what we did. And that's an example. Okay. Great. Thanks, Dad. Yeah, I think um, it's, what, it's what Dad's just said. You know, it, it, see, it looks similar on the surface, this thing of like advice shopping and going to different people. But it's different because at the centre of conversations about what does God want, Christ is at the centre. And that's the main thing that we were talking about. Like, Alan didn't feel like he needed to give Dad a dressed-up response or give it any more power than it already had because the word that he had was, God doesn't mind. And, that's, and that was the word of God to my parents at that time. Um, the other thing I wanted to draw out from it, which um, Dad touched on, and what we see in the scripture here, is that Reboam actually listens to the, the men, the young men that he grew up with, so he listens to his peer group. And I think that this can be quite key, you know, for young people sometimes. I think we have to be really careful if we immediately discount uh, or, like, don't listen to advice from people that are more mature in Christ than us if we think, oh, well, they just don't really understand. Um, because I think then we miss out on a lot of what God has to say to us through those people. So I think that's just a caution, really, for young people is just, you know, don't, don't only listen to your peers. Because to be honest with you, the young men that he grew up with probably think the same as him anyway. There's not really much difference. They've had the same experiences. Um, the next section, which Dan is going to read... Um, yeah, I guess just with this thing where's that? of advice shopping, I'll come back to it at the end, but just thinking about like when you go and ask for, ask for like wisdom from people is the first question, what does God want? And also when you're on the other side and you're helping someone through something, is that your first response or is it more just like your own thoughts and what you think? And there's room for both, but they are different. Verse 16, when all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, what share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, Israel, look after your own house, David. So the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. King Rehoboam set out, sent out Adoniram, who was in charge of forced labor, but all Israel stoned him to death. <clears throat> King Rehoboam, however, managed to get into his chariot and escape to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. When all the Israelites heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. Only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the house of David. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, so this is the result of his advice shopping and his foolishness. The kingdom of Israel has now split, and he's left with only two tribes, and the other ten tribes are going to be ruled over by Jeroboam. Um, I think here in this section, we just see really how foolish Rehoboam, Rehoboam is. Um, I've highlighted this bit here where he sends out Adoniram. So he's not happy that the people are leaving him. And the person that he sends out to try and rectify this situation is the man who's in charge of forced labor. And forced labor was the very thing that the people had an issue with. So it's just, he's completely delusional as a leader. And, you know, this man is stoned to death. 
because the people, that's the thing that the people are angry about. And what stands out to me here, I've got as the title, God is in the events produced by the sin and stupidity of men. Um, when, I, when I showed it to John, he said, maybe you should change it because it looks like it's not to do with women. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, God's also in the events produced by our stupidity as well. So um, yeah, this is actually a quote from Spurgeon. Um, but I really like the phrasing. And I think what stood out to me here is like the kingdom is in such a mess because of one man's foolishness and because of the decisions that he's making. And I think that if you were in his kingdom, you, you would feel quite lost, confused, hurt. You know, he, he, you would have perhaps left his kingdom to go to be of Jeroboam. I think it's a really awful situation. The kingdom is in chaos. Um, but this is the main thing that I felt that God wanted to say today is that in this chapter, it looks like God's plans are disrupted because people obviously had hope in David. They had hope in Solomon. Solomon was the most powerful king of Israel and people really thought he might be the one to, to lead them in the right way. But he's gone now and now, now you've got this fool in charge. And I think it looks like God's plans are disrupted and yet God is still in these events. And... The biggest example of this in the Bible is obviously in the death of Christ. Um, when Jesus dies, it's awful, and you can only imagine what that was like for his disciples, this kind of feeling of, we've been walking with this man, sharing our life with him, he's the Messiah, yet then he suddenly starts talking about needing to go and die, and then the events go and start to set in motion that lead to his death, and he actually dies, and he's actually dead for three days, and in that time, just the hurt and the confusion that they must have lived in, this idea of walking wounded, they were definitely walking wounded, and yet even in the death of Christ, God brings it together for his good, and it was all part of his greater plan, and I think that this is just the main thing that I want to encourage you with today, is that sometimes life can feel like that, but God does use all things, and we don't always see it immediately. It's not always like an immediate, oh, this bad thing happened, and then two weeks later, oh, yeah, I can, but I can see why. No, because some things are more difficult than that. And sometimes we might never see that, but we have to have this faith and hope in something more. Um, when I was speaking to Jamie about it, he reminded me of the story of Joseph, when Joseph's brothers essentially sell him into slavery and really mistreat him, and he ends up then being king. And then they need to come to him for help. And they think, oh, Joseph's going to turn us away. He's going to hate us. But he says to them, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. And I think it's that first bit, really, you know, we live in a fallen world, so awful things do happen. And people do intend to harm us. But we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. We know that. And um, that's really what I want to draw from this mess that is 1 Kings 12, is that God is working things for our good and he's more than able to do that. Um, Dan, the next section. Verse 21. When Rehoboam arrived in Jerusalem, he mustered all Judah and the tribe of Je Benjamin, 180,000 able young men, to go to war against Israel and to regain the kingdom for Rehoboam, son of Solomon. But this word came to Shemin Shemaiah. This word came to Shemaiah, the man of God. Say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, to all Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people. This is what the Lord says. Do not go up to fight against your brothers, the Israelites. Go home, every one of you, for this is my doing. So they obeyed the word of the Lord and went home again, as the Lord had ordered. Thank you. I love this bit of um, 1 Kings 12. And um, when I first read through the chapter, when I first knew I'd be speaking on this, this was the first thing that stood out to me, was this character of Shemaiah. And um, 
Spurgeon's actually written a really long essay on 1 Kings 12. It's very complicated and confusing. But if you're interested, you can, you can look it up. Some of it is really amazing. And I want to read an extract from it where he speaks about Shemaiah. Um, I have translated it into normal English, so um, that's good. <laughs> so Spurgeon says, I'm paraphrasing. He says, here is Shemaiah. Some of you never heard of him before. Perhaps you will never hear of him again. He appears once in this history, and then he vanishes. He comes and he goes. Only imagine this one man keeping from fighting 180,000 chosen men, warriors ready to fight against the house of Israel by giving to them, in very plain, unpolished words, the simple command of God. The Lord says, don't fight. And the Bible says, they listened to the word of the Lord and left according to the word. Why have we not such power? Because we do not always speak in the name of the Lord. We sometimes just give advice or speak God's word as God's word. When we have his word, we don't always say that that's what it is. If we are simply tellers out of our own thoughts, why should people pay attention to us? But if we can speak the truth as messengers of God and leave it as that, believing it ourselves and expecting great results from it, there will come more from our ministries than we have ever seen as yet. I just think it's amazing, like, this is, this is Shemaiah's only appearance in the Bible. This is, this is his whole thing. This is all he does, and all he actually does is he hears God's word, and then he goes and says it, and he doesn't dress it up. You know, when we were looking earlier in the chapter at the young men, and they're hyping him up, and they're saying, tell them about the scorpions, and tell them about the whips, and do this, and do that, and it's like the opposite with Shemaiah. He just, give, he just says it. He just says, God says, don't fight. God says, don't do it. And, and they listen. And I think people need to hear what God has to say. They don't need to hear what we think because it's not actually that, that important, what we think about things. But what people are looking for is what God says because so many people don't have that. And the other key thing here is that it says Shemaiah, the man of God. Um, and what I was thinking about when I was speaking to dad about this, is this thing of like, he is the man of God in this situation. And there are situations and spheres of our lives where we are that man or that woman of God. We're the only one. Like, we're the only one that could possibly bring God's word. And maybe we need to ask for more boldness to step up and say, 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 look, this is what God says. And um, I was also thinking about what we're doing as a church in terms of sharper witness and being ready to share our stories. And I think... This is so key. Shemaiah just says what God, this is what God says, and it has such an amazing effect. And I think let's ask also for that boldness in those situations where we are the man or we are the woman of God. And it's kind of, it's kind of up to us to step up and say something. And yeah, that's what I was thinking from here. Um, yeah. Um, The last section that we're going to look at is here, 25 to 33. Then Jeroboam fortified Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. From there he went out and built up Peniel. Jeroboam thought to himself, The kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. If these people go up and offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. Jeroboam built shrines on high places and appointed priests from all sorts of people, even though they were not Levites. He instituted a festival on the 15th day of the eighth month, like the festival held in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. 
This he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves he had made. And at Bethel he also installed priests at the high places he had made. On the fifteenth day of the eighth month, a month of his own choosing, he ordered sacrifices on the altar that he had built at Bethel. So he instituted the festival for the Israelites and went up to the altar to make offerings. Thanks. So it's very confusing because you've got Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Um, but what the person we're looking at here, Jeroboam, so Rehoboam was the original king, and when the kingdom split, the ten tribes went to Jeroboam. So he's, he's actually the adversary that God raised up. Um, and God actually promised him in, in Kings chapter 12, which we looked at with Jamie, um, God actually promised him the ten tribes. So it's something that God said, you're going to have this. But what you see here is not a man who really understands that God's given him something. He's very much trying to control and trying to grab it with his own strength. Um, and the key thing that we spoke about we did when we looked at this in the Bible study is the bits I've highlighted of Jeroboam thought to himself, and it was a month of his own choosing. And in some translation, translations, it said Jeroboam took counsel of himself. So where you had Rehoboam at the start of the chapter doing this advice shopping thing, Jeroboam is almost even more foolish than that because he doesn't even go to anyone else. He just takes counsel of himself and asks, oh, what, what do you think to himself? And, um, you know, how much more foolish can we be? Um, and I think what you see him create here is this kind of pick and choose as I go along kind of religion where it's kind of like oh it's what I feel is right I'm just going to do that and it's the opposite of submission to Christ which is what we live in um, and the other the other thing about where, where he sets up these idols I was talking to dad about it. he was saying it's like it's kind of quite convenient that he sets up these idols because they're not going to ever interfere with his power because they're, because they're nothing because they're idols and um, it's sometimes scary when we come into relationship with Christ and we let the Holy Spirit into our heart because he doesn't just, doesn't just sit there. He starts moving things around. And I was reminded of this really amazing skit, which I remember Jack doing. And Jamie, I'm sure you were involved in youth. And it's where the Holy Spirit as a roommate. And like the, so the, so like the Holy Spirit comes to this man and um, says, oh, can I move in? And the man says, yeah, I'm going to move in. And at first, it's all fine because the Holy Spirit seems to be in his room. But then he starts, like, moving things around. Like, I remember he, like, moves the fruit bowl. And then the man gets, like, really annoyed. Like, why have you moved the fruit bowl? And then it's, like, gets increase, he gets increasingly more irritated with him because he starts, like, changing the furniture. And then he starts to speak to the Holy Spirit about it. And he's like, why are you just changing everything? And the Holy Spirit's like, you know what? I just don't think we're changing enough. Like, I think we need to actually get rid of everything. And we need to get rid of the wallpaper, replaster the walls. I think we add an extension here. And it's just to illustrate that thing of, like, that's what God wants to do in us. He doesn't want to just move in as an addition. And um, it's what Terry mentioned last week as well. He said, be careful not to just pursue comfort in your life. And just to kind of create this nice little life where Jesus is part of it, but he's not, he's not the center and we're not letting him change things. Because there is a sacrifice in following Christ. There is things that we, you know, that, have, that we have to change and flex on. Um, and again, like when Jack was leading us in worship today and he was singing Set a Fire. And it says that I can't contain and that I can't control. And that's what we want. We want to be filled with God to the extent that it's like we can't, even if, even if we wanted to do what Jeroboam does and making this little religion for himself, we couldn't actually do it because it's like we're so full of the Holy Spirit that we can't ignore him when he starts moving things in our lives and asking us to give things up and asking us to change things because it's like this thing of, um, what I was thinking of was this contrast between comfort and God's plan and God's best for us because sometimes... I remember hearing like people talk about, oh, it's not good to be comfortable, and thinking, oh, but it's nice to be comfortable, and what, like, God doesn't want me to be happy, but it's not that, it's like, it's, God, it's God's best for you, and it's his love for you, it's like a parent, like, when a parent doesn't let you do something, it's not because they don't want you to be happy, of course not, it's the opposite, it's because they want you to be happy, and they know what's best for you, um, 
Yes, yeah, so that's the final bit I wanted to draw out here about Jeroboam and his created faith, is that following Christ is something very different. And, you know, we're all at different stages in our walks with Christ. Some of us have been following him for a really long time. Some of us are maybe right at the beginning. And this is, this is what God has for us, is this thing of recognizing that our hearts are deceitful above all things, that what we think is right or not right for us isn't really true because our hearts don't really know. And we have to ask, in Psalm 51, verse 10, it says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That has to be our prayer as we follow Christ continually. God, would you clean my heart? Would you renew my spirit that I might follow you, that I might serve you? Yeah, faith in God is inconvenient at times. Um, These were my main four points, and I thought about some reflection questions. Um, So the first bit where I was talking about advice shopping, I was thinking maybe if if that's particularly speaking to it might be, is is our first thought, what does God want? So whether that's when you're advising someone or when you're asking someone to help you, to help you hear God, is that our first thought? The second one, and and this is really the main one that I feel is, do you need your hope renewed? Are you feeling a bit lost and wounded in what you're going through? And do you need that reminder of why it is that we're here, what it is that we're doing? Because we have things to be doing. We have a kingdom to be building, and we want to be part of that. The third thing I was thinking about with Shemaiah specifically is, do we need that boldness? You know, he's certainly very bold. He steps up, he tells the king to stop fighting, and the king listens to him. Maybe, we, maybe we're lacking a bit in that boldness, and that's something we want to be asking for. Um, And the final thing is what I've just been speaking about is that are there areas of our life or perhaps our whole life where we're pursuing this comfort and actually God wants to come in and change everything and wants to really move our furniture around in a good way. 